turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, Professor GR, you're there? Live and well. <laughs> good, good. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Sure. Uh, let me give you a, a brief introduction and then you can get going. Um, Professor Jura is a professor of law at the S.J. Queeney College of Law, the University of, of Utah. He's a distinguished fellow at the Consortium for Research and Study of the Holocaust and the Law <clears throat> and the Law at um, uh, Chicago Kent College of Law, uh, and a distinguished fellow and counselor at the International Center for the Conflict Resolution. Katz School of Business, University of Pittsburgh. He is inaugural chair of the University of Utah Independent Review Committee and the chair of the Gymnastic uh, Canada Task Force on Sexual Abuse and Assault. Uh, Professor Giora uh, has published extensively both in the United States and Europe and on issues related to national security, limits on interrogation, religion and terrorism, Limits of Power, Multiculturalism, and Human Rights. Most, uh, his most recent book is Armies of Enablers, Survivor Stories of Complicity and Betrayal in Sexual Assault. His research contributed to legislation and ratified by the um, Utah legislature signed to law by Governor Cox in March of 2021, 2021 and 21, uh, that criminalized criminalizes bystanders who do not intervene on behalf of children and vulnerable adults. Uh, Professor Giora, Amos, you're on, please, please begin. Thank you for having me. So um, let's call me Amos, I hate the professor thing. Okay. <laughs> that makes it life a lot easier for all of us. So um, to dive in, if that's okay, Stu, just off we go, right? Yes, please. Thank you. What is of particular interest to me, and the reason that I was um, delighted to have this conversation, is as Stu correctly mentions, most of my work today focuses on, on two, if not a, a third issue, and that I'm going to actually, if you will, use this opportunity to run some ideas by you, and then you will um, push back, which is something that I very much welcome. In that sense, for, for me, it's, it's more interesting to have a, a dialogue rather than a monologue, but it'll give me a few minutes to make the argument. One, two, three, go. I was raised in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Both of my parents are Holocaust survivors um, from Hungary. My um, father survived two death marches. My mother is literally the Anne Frank of Budapest in that she was in the attic with my grandmother, twice taken to be shot, twice saved, long story how they were saved. Um, the two death marches my father survived, of which I knew nothing, because my parents never told me a word about the Holocaust. Um, their stories formed a book, was the basis for a book called The Crime of Complicity, The Bystander in the Holocaust. As I've come to the conclusion, I'm not the first, I'm assuming I'm not the last, that with all due respect to Hitler and friends, the Holocaust doesn't happen without the bystander. So we can talk about Hitler and, you know, and friends, but for me, the, the, the true story of the Holocaust, to really understand the Holocaust, requires understanding the bystander. And as Stu correctly mentions, in the, over the course of five years, I've been very involved in legislative efforts, particularly here in Utah, that resulted in criminalizing the bystander. And the way we did it here is through the lens of mandatory re reporting. But the idea really is to criminalize the bystander. That book came out um, four years ago, and I genuinely thought I was done with whole, this whole issue of bystander. Um, it was interesting, but it, it was enough for me. And then my publisher, which is the American Bar Association, we had dinner in Chicago and I don't drink, but so I guess he plowed me with a big piece of cake because at the end of the evening, he convinced me to write a book about the enabler. And the way he did it is he asked me two, I mean, two set of questions, the way these things work. He asked me if I'd heard of the Catholic church. I said, yes, I have. He asked me if I was aware of the sexual assaults at Michigan State University and USA Gymnastics. And I said, well, of course, I'm a huge sports fan. And he says, well, there's your next book. And I had no idea what the word enabler meant. I had never heard of enabler. But over the course of a year and a half, I interviewed um, those of you who are sports fans, many of the names will be familiar to you, athletes from Michigan State, um, USA Gymnastics, and Ohio State who were abused by team the team doctor, Larry Nasser at Michigan State, USA Gymnastics, Strauss at Ohio State. But there was never anyone in the room. And the only way that those the two of them, Strauss and, and Nasser, could violate 
hundreds, I mean, altogether maybe thousands of, of survivors was because those in a position of authority, the enablers, knew and made the conscious decision not to do a damn thing. The best example I can give you of an enabler is, is the following. Her name is Kathy Clagus. She was, past tense, fortunately, the gymnast, women's gymnastics coach at Michigan State. She's a god-awful human being. I wish her nothing but the worst. Um, Lindsay Lemke, who was one of, who was the captain of the team, had been assaulted by Nasser, um, probably beginning at the age of 14-ish, including when she was at Michigan State. And she goes to, to her coach, Kathy Clagus, and tells her coach, that's it, I'm done. I can't deal with this anymore. And I've made a decision, um, I'm going to the police. And she's a 21-year-old college sen senior. Clagus says to her the following, Lindsay, three things. One, if you go to the police, I want you to think about how this will impact Larry and his family. Two, you know, Lindsay, if you go to the police, I'm gonna have to talk to your parents. And three, and most damning of all, she says to Lemke, I remind you scholarships are given and scholarships are taken. That's a threat. And I'm happy to report that uh, Coach Clegg has found herself in jail, which is a good place for her to be, um, because she enabled Larry Nasser's hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds, thousands of violations of, of Lemke and others. And I'll give you one other example of how the enablers work. There's, um, again, those of you who are uh, women softball fans will recognize the name, Tiffany Thomas Lopez. She's violated by, when I use the word violated, I mean, assault. She's assaulted by Larry Nasser 150 times. And she goes to her trainer, not the coach, the trainer, a woman named Leona Hayden and shows graphically to Hayden what Nasser is doing to her, spares her no details. Hayden turns bright red and goes, oh my God, oh my God, this is horrible. Um, you gotta go talk to the head trainer. So Tiffany, who is a college junior, goes to the head trainer, a horrible woman named um, Destiny Teaker Hawk. And what the head trainer does is the following, manipulates with the head softball coach to have Tiffany removed from the team. Tiffany leaves um, the softball team, leaves Michigan State and goes back home. But I don't want you to think this is only women doing all this stuff. Um, there's a swimmer at Ohio State. He's anonymous in my book, and so he'll be anonymous here. He's assaulted by Strauss, um, assaulted being assaulted. And he goes to the, he's a swimmer. And he goes from Strauss's office to the pool deck where he meets the coach. And he's, I mean, he's just, you know, in a flurry of emotions and distraught and all that. And he tells the coach exactly what Strauss had just done to him. And the coach screams at him in full view of the entire swim team on the pool deck, tells him the following magic words, shut the fuck up and get in the fucking pool now, full stop. The swimmer dives into the pool, swims that practice that night, quits the swim team that day, the next day leaves Ohio State University and never goes back to college. So when I gathered these stories about the enabler, I came to the conclusion that it's not enough to say, oh gosh, this is a problem, we've got to do something, which is why I'm now very involved in um, efforts to criminalize the enabler, because I think that the actions of coach this, trainer that, coach this, trainer that, university president here, university president there, it's not enough to say to them, you know, you maybe should you know, get a better job, maybe you should do something else with your life, look for different opportunities. We need to criminalize. Some of you are going to tell me, oh, but you know, the carrot and the stick and all that, and I'll push right back. I mean, and I want you to push back on the pushback, and I'll say BS on that because the carrot doesn't work. The question is, who are we seeking to protect and to whom do we owe a duty? And I make the argument that the duty is simple as simple can be. You know, you can look at Rousseau, Locke and Hobbes in the context of the social contract, the duty owed is to the vulnerable. All of these people are vulnerable, full stop. I'm writing a new book with, um, again, those of you who are, um, you know, you guys live in the East Coast, so you're Patriots fans, some of you. There was a guy who played for the Patriots in the early 90s. His name was John Vaughn, who played football at the University of Michigan. Um, Vaughn is one of 900, you heard correctly, 900, former University of Michigan football players and other athletes who are presently suing the University of Michigan um, because over the course of 50 years, one doctor assaulted, abused, and raped probably somewhere around 5,000 student athletes and students. 
Vaughn himself um, was raped by the team doctor 40 times. The only way that the University of Michigan team doctor who's deceased, Bob Anderson, could commit tens of thousands of sexual assaults over 50 years was because his actions were enabled by those who had an interest in enabling him. But, but, but I want to make the point that yes, they were enabling him, but more importantly, and far more nefariously, they were protecting the good name of the University of Michigan. But I also need to be here in, self, in full disclosure, I want to be honest with you all, um, while all this was happening, my late father was, in the, uh, was a faculty member at the University of Michigan Medical School. And if I were to do about a 360 in my office, my office is totally maize and blue, maize and blue chair, M go blue this and M go blue that. So I've made a decision, I'm, I'm addressing this directly and honestly, because some of the enablers um, were frankly friends of my parents, which is not comfortable, but there you have it. It is what it is. But so when I hear from John Vaughn, big tough football player, Afro African-American guy, that he and hundreds, thousands of his other teammates were assaulted over 50 years by this one doctor. It's clear to me this can only happen if the institution has made the, the, the conscious decision or institutional actors have made the conscious decision to protect the institution rather than protect the vulnerable. The institutional actors who protect the, who protect the, the perp don't care about the perp. I mean, they don't really care about Bob Anderson, like at Michigan State, they didn't really care about Larry Nassar. They care about one thing, protect the institution. So it's this notion of institutional complicity. It's, by the way, it's the exact same thing with the Catholic Church. I interviewed Catholic Church survivors, men and women alike, who will tell you the exact same thing. I mean, the, the, priests, are the, the priests are horrible, but what was more important than, the, than protecting the priest was protecting the good name, good name of the Catholic Church. And um, I assume all of you are also aware of the fact that um, in the Orthodox, I, uh, Stu, I don't know if you mentioned, I commute between here and Jerusalem because we live in Israel. Um, I assume you all know that the Orthodox community um, in Jerusalem and elsewhere in Israel also has um, rampant sexual assault abuse within, within the community. It's a closed community and you can't penetrate it and the rabbis are protected because the rabbis are protected, which is outrageous and egregious. While working on all these projects, a, a new project has made its way to my desk and I don't like the term, but it is the term of art, and it's called pass the trash. Pass the trash means the following, and it particularly happens in schools, and I can give you hundreds of examples by now, unfortunately. A teacher has, and I don't like the word, but it's the, it's the term used, but it's the wrong term, has an affair over a year or so with a student. She's 15, 16, and he's, you know, he's an older guy, and everybody knows. I two days ago zoomed with a woman who's in her 40s who for a year year and a half had an affair but I, again i hate the word affair because she was 15 and 16 so it's not a fair he was 40 he's 25 years older than she is they had sex every day in his office and or his house he's married and it was so known that um, the school nurse said to her one day and i quote not important her name are you pregnant with Mr. Smith's child? That to me is beyond stunning. And it tells me that the structure, the system, everybody knew. Question is, what do we do with all this? Do we say, oh, boo hoo, you know, gosh, that's really bad, unfortunately, you know? Or do we as a community, as a society say, you know, dainu, khalas, enough is enough, and begin the process of asking ourselves, how do we proactively, the polite word is assertively, the impolite word is aggressively, attack those who are clearly enabling the harm. Again, the perpetrator is not interesting. I mean, Larry Nasser's in jail for the rest of his life. Strauss committed suicide. Anderson is dead. I mean, they're not relevant to anything from my perspective. What is relevant are those who enable this. So for me, I am on this, um, one person bandwagon, I guess. Um, and that's why I so appreciate this opportunity to speak to you all to at least make an argument, try to convince that we need to rearticulate. Carl, hang on two seconds. I'm about to finish the thought and I'll be happy to answer your question. To rearticulate the relationship between an institution and its vulnerable members 
and in doing so to also demand accountability of those who created the, the, the infrastructure of enabling, because I genuinely, genuinely believe that there is an enabling culture. There's a triangle of institutional complicity, enabling culture, one plus one leads to two, and the two very much is sexual assault, sexual abuse, um, and the consequences thereafter. And in order to do that, we need to have these conversations, unpleasant as they may be, boo-hoo, and ask ourselves, how do we more effectively pr protect those who need protecting? Carl, I saw that you're right. I learned how to I learned the Zoom thing. I saw your hand is up. I um I was actually getting in line for the questions. Great, great presentation. I don't know if it's too early to ask the questions. Oh no, go ahead. Push back. Based on your no, standards. No. Based on your standards and definitions of an enabler, would you classify Joe Paterno as an enabler? 100%. Or was he just oh, Joe Paterno. Out of yeah, so it's interesting you asked that. Um, I tried to get to the boys who Sandusky raped. Um, and of all the institutions that I've written about, I simply couldn't get to them. Um, when, what's his name, the, the oh shit, what's his name, the quarterback? Um, the quarterback coach, McQuady, calls Paterno from the locker room after seeing what he sees, and Paterno tells him, you know, to take care of it. And he didn't, or he thought he did. Is Joe Paterno an enabler? Probably. I don't think Joe's a bystander, because I don't think Joe was there when Sandusky was raping the boys, either in the locker room or in Sandusky's basement. Um, is Joe an enabler? Probably. Mm, with all due respect to Joe Paul. Steve, you had your hand up? I, um, Stu, do you want to call, do the, the calling? Or do you want me to just look? Because I just I, I see part of the gallery. I don't want to miss anybody. Steve yeah, Fisher? Yeah, I'll talk. Does it, you know, but we're, you said that, you know, they, they brush it under the table because they don't want the bad publicity. Right. Doesn't it ultimately come out even worse that you knew about this and you did nothing about it as far as their reputation goes? You know, that is. Let me tell you a really shitty story, which will answer your question. Do you guys know what 23andMe is? Yeah. Yeah. So Dr. Anderson. Um, collected semen from the football players. He masturbated them and or made them masturbate. He collected their semen without their permission. He simultaneous to that had a fertility clinic in Ann Arbor and claimed to be an expert. I mispronounce it. Maybe one of you knows how to turn it. It's andronage, andronage, which is like the study of, reproduct of male reproduction. The football players are of the belief, take a deep breath, a deep that breath. there are children out there in the world who are their children. Um, so when Vaughn reached out, reached out 23 and me, and I'm not sure if the others will all do the same, what really complicates it, and this is where Michigan is going to look really bad, The University of Michigan purchased his private practice. He was had a private practice in addition to being the team doctor. I, I interviewed a guy who's a friend of my friend of a friend in Ann Arbor whose medical practice was also purchased by the University of Michigan. And I asked this gentleman who doesn't know me from a hole in the wall. I asked him, why would Michigan buy Bob Anderson's private practice when I know because I've researched this and I like Woodward and Bernstein that Anderson's private practice is not particularly successful financially. I asked this guy, why would Michigan buy a financial practice that's not successful? And this retired professor of medicine doesn't know me from Adam. I can only quote it. And we're putting this quote in the book. He says to me, how fucking stupid are you? I said, okay, obviously really dumb. Why am I so stupid? He said Michigan bought Bob Anderson's private practice for one reason and one reason only, to get a hold of his medical records. So to your question, does the university look worse down the road? The answer is yes. 
We're trying to find the medical records. We're spending zillions of hours trying to find them um, to date unsuccessfully so. So you can do one, you're a smart guy, do one plus one and you'll come up with two also. Does that make Michigan look awful? Yes, I also, you know, full disclosure, does this make me uncomfortable? Of course, I grew up in, Ar in Ann Arbor. I have season tickets to Michigan football. I'm flying tomorrow to Ann, Ar to Ann Arbor, but the truth needs to be told. Next question, Stu, you're the boss. Arcady. Unmute yourself, Arcady. Mark. I have a question for you. Maybe it's not related to sexual issues, but still it's very, very important and profound, uh, which is distortion of fact and distortion of reality, which affects United States a great deal. Media uh, usually show beating of people by police during the final stage of the arrest without showing a uh, cause for the arrest. And as a result, it looks like media, like police brutality. And this distortion of uh, what happened in reality uh, result in riots, in fires, in burnings, in demonstrations, and uh, you know, unrest. So how to address this distortion of facts or actually enabling those riots by the media? What do you think? Wait, there's, there's some background noise that's a tad irritating. Can someone mute? Joe, I think that's you, Joe, Adriana. No, there's no noise coming from my area. No kitchen? No, no I'm not. <laughs> Probably our arts. Hey, uh, everybody who is not of, speaking, mute yourself. Yeah. The only ones should be art, uh, uh, should be Stu, Steve, and uh, myself. Okay. So should I repeat the question? No, no, I got the question. Yeah. Um, I don't know to what incident, are you, I'm not sure to what you're referring. If you're referring I, to, Dan, to I, Derek I, Saban and-, and I, give, I give an example, Rodney King's beating. Only was shown the final stage of when police tried to arrest this guy without showing that he resisted arrest. And for why? And same applied to other uh, events. Yeah, I'm not sure. Listen, I, I think if like, I mean, the classic example, which I, I think is, it is what it is, is, is Derek Shaven murdering uh, George Floyd. There's no yeah. distortion there. He murdered him. And, and Derek Shaven needs to spend the rest of his life in jail. That's a good place for him, no, um, yeah. without any doubt. Um, you know, the, one of the realities of, of this machine, right, is I turn it on when I turn it on, I turn it off when I turn it off. Um, but there is no doubt that, that today we, you know, it's the Washington Post, right, that says, um, uh, the light and truth are the best things possible. I have no doubt that if the camera would have been shined a lot brightly on police decades ago, um, we would have seen um, the kind of brutality that was assumed that was never proved. I personally have no problem with that whatsoever. There is at the end of the day a court of law. You bring, you bring your evidence, I bring my evidence, and a jury of your peers decides. Um, you know, with, with Rodney King, um, yeah, I, I don't want quite know how Rodney King fits into this, but you know, there were riots. And uh, again, if people who are rioting this side or that side, I have no, no problem with, with, with prosecuting police. I'm a big proponent of that in the same way that I'm a proponent of, of, of prosecuting those who attack police. I don't see the media as complicit here in anything. And again, Derek Shaven is a classic example of, thank God there was someone there photographing Derek Shaven murdering George Floyd. I have no problem with that at all. Hey, hey, Miss, do you want to keep talking or do you want to no, answer? Keep going. I enjoy the, the give and take is great. That's okay with you, boss, man. Yep. Go ahead. Lloyd. Lloyd. Yeah, I'm you. Uh, um, professor, I got a. Uh, Amos, uh, Amos, Amos, Amos. Amos. Okay. Um, anyway, um, isn't this symptomatic of the cultural mores that we now live under, where we have a lot of this abuse um, uh, basically being monetized? Uh, by either the media or uh, basically the media. And uh, do you feel that that has a, a significant uh, effect on the number, uh, the types of abuse? And unless we change the, uh, the cultural mores, the, uh, nothing's going to happen. You're going to see 
a proliferation of this uh, uh, type of behavior from now on. Not sure what it's interesting. I'm not sure what you mean by cultural mores. I think that what say, let's take John Vaughn. So when I got an email the first time from Vaughn was in July of 2020. And he starts off the email, uh, dear Mr. Giora or Mr. Giora, my name is John Vaughn. And because I'm this huge Michigan fan, I obviously knew immediately who John Vaughn was. Um, he, for the first months, in terms of his interaction with the media and the lawsuit, he was John Doe, not John Vaughn. And then he made the decision to, you know, come out and say, you know, I am John Vaughn. 95% plus of the other complainants, plaintiffs at Michigan are John Vaughn, are John Doe, not by name, but they go by John Doe for a variety of reasons. Um, cultural mores. One of the John Doe's um, who I've interviewed, I won't tell you his name, obviously. We talked about why he's John Doe and here are the reasons. He's got high school aged children and he thinks that if the community knows that he was raped, assaulted, and people will ask, how is it that a big guy, you know, I don't know if you guys are football fans, these are huge guys. How is it that a huge guy allowed himself to be, allowed himself in quotations, to be assaulted by, a, in their words, a dweeb white guy? And his concern is that people will not let their children come over to his house to play with his children because maybe there's something wrong with him. Is that a cultural moray? Two, he's afraid that because he's a, in business, you know, not important where he lives, that business associates might look at him a little bit like this. Is that a cultural moray? Um, you know, I don't know how, how much you car carefully you follow the Larry Nasser story. The first woman to come out was Den Hall, Rachel Den Hollander, who was, um, I think she was Jane Doe. The second one is Jamie Dancher, who was Jane Doe too. When she was Jane Doe too, pardon my English, but we're all friends here. She was viciously slut shamed by her teammates who then subsequently apologized. Is that a cultural moray? I think that the reality is having spent literally thousands of hours with these people over the past three years. I think you need to know the following one, it is a mere handful, it's, it's tragic, who have gotten their lives back in order or have been able to move on with their lives. You know, Judith Herman, the great psych professor of psychiatry at Harvard, writes about the trauma after the trauma. And what she makes the argument that while the, the rape, the assault is bad, it's peanuts compared to the trauma after the trauma. The fact that you weren't believed, the fact you were dismissed, the fact that people just tell you, you know, honey, move on. The fact that the police lose rape kits, the fact that people don't really believe you, people, the fact they say to the 20 years later, why did you keep, why didn't you ever say anything then? Maybe it was your own behavior, you know, the whole notion of victim blaming. So when I tell you that from my perspective, and I don't represent anybody but myself, that we really need to re-articulate the um, social contract that also frankly extends to how we, how we perceive, receive um, those who are brave enough to come forward and say, this happened to me. Um, they will tell you, men and women alike, black and white alike, NFL players, not NFL players. It's devastating when they know they're not believing. And the, these, I, mean, I want to emphasize, I don't know if you if people are football fans, these are huge guys and they know, they know that from the public perspective, public perception, they are not viewed sympathetically, unlike the girls who are, you know, 14 year old cute girls. These guys are not cute. These are big dudes. Um, and they're aware of the fact that the public perception of them is how could it, bullshit. No way the, a guy like you could let a doctor touch him. But you know, if you know anything about big time sports and if you want to get on the field, um, the coach sends you, you got to do what you got to do. Is that a cultural moray? You know, 
I'm a huge sports fan. I mean, huge, huge sports fan. Um, I make a confession. You know, I go to the I'll go to the game in Ann Arbor on Saturday, and I'm conflicted as hell because I know the, the some of the price is that they are paying. On the other hand, there'll be 110,000 people in Ann Arbor, you know, and go blue just like they'll be in nationwide. Even though more and more of us are aware of how um, damaged the system is from the perspective of the person in peril. Cultural moray is a great question. I mean, it's something that absolutely needs to be discussed. I, I mean, I agree with you about the, the question. I'm not sure we agree about the cultural moray. Uh, Brian? Uh, thanks for your talk, Amos. Um, my qu question is, like one person in a know, if they know what's going on, they really, they could stand up and say something but they're just gonna get fired by the institution. That'll just happen left and right. So yeah. do you so have any ideas how they could kind of get support so they just won't get fired and dismissed? Sure, As, I mean, the whole, the, the, the cost or the price or the danger of a whistleblower. Right, I got it, I got it. So Anderson starts assaulting in, the, in 66 in Ann Arbor. Um, we now know he started off by volunteering in the high school in, in Ann Arbor. Um, Cause in, at the time in Ann Arbor, there was one high school. And the, the, his initial uh, victims were 17 and 18 year old boys who wanted a draft deferment from Vietnam. And it was a quid pro quo, sex for the sex for deferment. And then he's hired by Michigan, and we move on. In November of 1979, an associate vice president goes to Bob Anderson and says, Bob, you're out. I'm hearing too many stories from boys about you. X weeks later, that decision is rescinded by the university vice president a university vice president. And in the spring of 1980, the University of Michigan um, puts out to the Board of Regents, you know, the yearly report, blah, 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 and lauds Bob Anderson for his remarkable service, duck, 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 okay. So here, clearly people knew because they fired him. Vaughn and I are spending zillions of hours trying to figure out what happened in the interim between here and here? Somebody got to somebody, right? Okay. The whistleblower, um, you know, there are whistleblower protection laws. Does that always work? Um, no, but hang on. But there are ways to, to share with the authorities nefarious conduct, but then you're going to push back and tell me, yeah, but what do we do when the authority is also a piece of shit, right? I mean, that's, um, so um, in the instance I told you when the nurse says to the kid, are you pregnant? There at all levels, she was hemmed in because nobody was going to believe her. Um, you know, in most of these cases, these kids don't share this with their parents. Um, I can assure you, all of you, that many of these kids who have shared with their parents, regardless of the age with which they've shared their, with their parents, has caused enormous rift within families, devastating rift within families, because the parents say, well, I failed you. You didn't trust me. You didn't believe me. The whistleblower is, is an important point. And, you know, those of us who deal with this, I can make all the arguments for you, but you're going to push back on the pushback and say, yeah, but it's always going to be that person who's going to be afraid of losing their job. Um, and we're aware of that so much so that in the bystander legislation that was passed here, we actually free the bystander from culpability of acting and it will endanger you and or your family. So we are aware, yes, there has, there's the bystander, but there's also the counter to that is the possibility. But if I look at Michigan State, you know, Kathy Clegas and the others who I referenced to, they weren't afraid of losing their job. They were simply, in, they were um, protecting Michigan State. Clegas, I think was probably enthralled with Nasser, Christ knows why. Um, but they were all about protecting Michigan State. Uh, listen, at Ohio State, in addition to the coach, which I shared with you, 
one of the other guys who I interviewed went from Strauss's office to his coach. He's talking to his coach. He's telling him exactly what happened. The athletic director, you know, in a place like Ohio State, the athletic director is pretty important, almost as important as the football coach, um, laughs in his face and walks away. Uh, that person failed. I mean, there's no other description for it. Um, it kills these guys that, that the, by the way, the book, Armies of Enablers, um, wasn't my title, wasn't my idea. It came from Lemke, the one who went to Clagus, um, because I talked about an enabler. This maybe goes to your point. It goes, I, I talked about an enabler, an enabler. She said to me all the time, no, it's armies. They were hemmed in. That's what's so devastating. Not a happy story. Stu, how are we doing? Are they all falling asleep? Are we okay? Oh, good. Larry Holtzman has a question. Yeah. Thank you, Amos, uh, for a great presentation. I have a question about uh, the definition of sexual assault and rape. Uh, what other actions encompass sexual assault? And I cannot believe that a guy like uh, Anderson, uh, while in college, would allow himself to be raped, actual raped. Um, Rape is penetration. Yeah, I, re I realize that, but what other uh, actions are defined as sexual assault? I'm curious assault? why you don't believe that a guy like John Vaughn, who's this huge guy, doesn't, can't be raped. I meant, I meant Vaughn, yeah. Why do, you think, Vaughn. why do you think 900 guys can't be raped? I'm gonna push back on you. Why do you think they can't be raped? I mean, I'm not about whether it's digital or not. Why do you think, uh, why, do you, why do you not accept that? Uh, I have a hard time, a big guy like that. A big guy like that wants to get in the field and is told this is a necessary prostate exam. And has inserted into his anus what he has inserted into his anus. It's made very clear to him, the only way to play in the field is get a, go to Dr. Anderson. The only way to have Dr. Anderson say you're kosher to play is for Anderson to say you're fit. You're fit. The only way to have him say you're fit is to do what he needs. A to B to C. Wow. <laughs> it's not, it is not complicated. The expression that these guys use is if you're in the tub, you're not in the club. Meaning if you're injured, you can't play. It's Anderson. Who's um, getting back to that exa prostate exam, uh, is it, an action with his finger or is it action with his penis? Finger, fingers, without consent. Oh. Uh, gotcha. Okay, so it's it's a, uh, a finger digital action. Digital, digital, digital that... penetration without consent. Oh, okay. That's right. Now I understand. That's helpful. Okay. So it's not penal, uh, in, 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 I, I want to be clear here. I have yet to meet with a guy who was rape um, genital by penis. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. I don't know of an instance. The guys I've dealt with, it's um, digital penetration. Okay, uh, that makes it clear. Thank you. Sure. Joe? You're mute, Joe. Amos, thank you. Uh, sure. You know, this is not something that is new. I, you mentioned going back to 66 in New York. Uh, one of the, the more famous high schools had a group called NAMBA, the National Association of Man Boy. Uh, and that came out and nothing ever developed from it. Uh, the complicity uh, of the uh, administrators, the higher ups. Uh, yeah. How does this go on for decades and still? You know, it, it's continuing. I mean, it's not that it stopped with uh, some of the recent revelations. It's still going on, I'm sure, in uh, schools and uh, religions and, and, and whatnot today. How, how do you, how do we put an end to it? Uh, or have we become so inured to this stuff that uh, by, you know, what Lloyd mentioned, the change in culture over the years, uh, we become inured to any, deviant behavior. You know, it's a, it's a, the, the word inured is, is a great word. I mean, it's an awful word, but it's a great word. Um, the girls, 
and I use the word deliberately because they call themselves girls, even though today, you know, they're 40 year old women. Um, the girls, there was something appealing about them because they were so vulnerable. That it doesn't obviously apply to, to the guys. And I think because it is difficult to accept that, that, that guys can also be vulnerable and because it's, you know, story after story, I don't know how carefully you guys follow this. You know, there's a guy, there was a physician at, at USC who um, assaulted 15,000 college students over the course of his OBGYN career at USC. The numbers are, are so staggering that it, they probably at some point lose impact. I mean, stop and ask yourself, how many boys have been raped in the Catholic church? By the way, how many girls have been, how many nuns as I came to learn, I had no idea. Nuns also raped. I had no idea. I had no idea whatsoever. Um, you know, ask yourself how many rabbis uh, rape. It, it, there is a danger, and I, and I understand what you're saying, that the numbers lose meaning at some point. Um, it's a problem. Um, my response to that, or my modest effort in that spirit, was in my book was to really be very specific about specific things done to specific people. So to give the reader a sense of an individual rather than some mass of individuals, because I thought it was important for, for the reader to step into the shoes of the victim. Because I think otherwise you're 100% right. It literally can go in one ear and come out the other, which is, a, which is a significant problem, which is why I think it's really important to, to focus on a few and to personalize their stories. I mean, not, it's not my story but to bring their specific story to the audience's attention. Because I think you're right. Otherwise it's, you know, one more, you know, look at the Boy Scouts. Christ knows how many boys were assaulted in the Boy Scouts. Um, now, but I agree, I understand what you're saying. I have a second question. That, Please. Uh, I had to word it, but you know, the, the, the recent situation with uh, Mario Como, uh, mm. Uh, not Mario, uh, Andy. Chris. Uh, in New right, York. Chris? The governor, uh, whatever those names. Yeah, uh, the governor of New the York. Governor, Andrew. Governor, Andrew. Andrew. The former governor. Correct. Uh, I mean, having been years ago, in fact, involved with some political uh, campaigns and with politicians, uh, the politicians like movie stars like athletes, star athletes have their groupies and some of these people throw themselves at the politician to, uh, for whatever reasons, uh, they have ulterior motives to get ahead or to get into their group or whatnot. And yeah, you know, they're human, the politicians or the, 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 in this case, Coleman, and I'm not defending him, uh, they're human, and if and if a, a woman throws herself at him, and then he does something, you know, <clears throat> where does that fit into this whole picture of, you know, is he responsible or is the the other person uh, responsible for their actions, or their inactions? Well, or you know, their action of, you know, putting themselves in a position to be. Uh, uh, I won't say abused or whatever, but uh, you know, the, as the groupies uh, that go after right. these, these so, people. You know, I'm not quite. I'm never quite sure exactly. I've been asked this before. What you know? I, I hate the term, but she was there. She made herself available. Whatever the hell that means. Um, in the case of, of these athletes, they signed up to be an athlete. They didn't sign up to be a victim. Well, that's it. And they fully expected, you know, like at the Corolli Ranch in Texas where Nasser was assaulting left, right, and center, uh, the Corollis didn't allow the parents to come. And we could have a whole different conversation, the role of parents in all this, but I, I you can disagree with me, which is fine. I made the decision not to address the parental question. And as a decision I made, um, there are gyms where parents can't come to practices. 
Um, is that a problem? Yeah, probably. Um, as Stu mentioned in his introduction, I, I chaired the Gymnastics Canada Task Force on Assault. And there are, um, you know, I'm now meeting with parents who were told you can't come to practice. And they pulled their kid out of that particular club when they saw their kid coming home with injuries. They said, wait, it's, it, it can't be. On the other hand, we also need to be honest about the following. It will make some of you uncomfortable. That's okay. There's a thing called parental reflected glory. You know, parents want their kid to, to do well. Their parents want their kid to play football at Michigan. And, you know, you're willing to, you, you want to be, have your kid in the Olympics. Um, and perhaps that leads to um, closing of the eyes or the turning of the head. Um, one of the girls who I interviewed, um, she's assaulted by Nasser. I'm not making this shit up. She's assaulted by Nasser 650 times. And she makes the deliberate decision to harm herself um, as a way not to be sent back to the Caroli Ranch. Because from, for her parents, they had invested enormous money time, resources, in some cases, marriage, in some cases, you know, the well-being of siblings, because they realized that here they had an Olympic elite athlete. And the only way she could get out of this hellhole was to harm herself. That is, it, but she didn't sign up to be violated by Nasser 650 times. By the way, that's not Larry's record. Larry's record is 850 times on one girl. But isn't there something wrong with the parents when it comes to something like that? I mean, well, you know, you, you put your kids' well being, not, not the parents their don't know. Success. Parents uh, don't it, know. The only instance, and I'll, it is interesting your question, it's a complicated question. The, the USA Gymnastics parents never knew because they weren't allowed at the Crowley Ranch. At Michigan State, when the girls were younger, sorry, girls in Lansing who saw Nasser were not at Michigan State yet. There were instances when the parents were in the room when Larry, when Larry Nasser is violating their daughter. I interviewed one of the girls who today is old, you know, in her 40s. While he's assaulting her, her mom and dad are in the examination room. He had the curtain in such a way that neither parent saw what he was doing to the child. While assaulting the daughter, he was talking with mom about the latest edition of the New Yorker. He had this down to a science. These are horribly manipulative bastards. That's the polite version. Stu, you did, you, I assume you gave them a heads up. This is not a happy story. This is not like, you know, Goldilocks going for through the park. Uh -huh. This stuff really sucks. Did, did, did you have more uh, uh, presentation to do? I know we kind of started asking questions in the- No, uh, I, if there are, are there other questions? I don't see any questions. All right. So here's where we are. As I told you at the beginning, we're halfway through. I'm like this one man bandwagon on this issue which has totally come to um, dominate my life. Um, most mornings I wake up to emails from survivors and most evenings I finish my day with phone calls with survivors. And I think the reason is I'm not a particularly interesting person. I think the reason is because I'm asking them one question and one question only, which in many ways ties in all of your questions. The question I asked them is what were your expectations of the enabler? I don't want to hear about the perp. I want to hear where he put his fingers. It doesn't interest me. What fascinates me is your expectations of the enabler, the person who you thought would, would protect you. And when I ask them, what were your expectations? The one word is protect. And then the follow-up question is, and what are the consequences? And the one word is they were abandoned. And that for me is a paradigm, protection abandonment, it doesn't work. And that's why um, I think it's essential, even if you disagree with every word I said, which is fine, 
it's a conversation we have to have, even if it makes us uncomfortable. You know, I sit on a college campus here at the University of Utah. Statistics today are one out of four college girls report being sexually assaulted. And we all know that if one out of four are reporting that the number is much higher of actual, of actual assaults. Guys, it's somewhere between one out of seven to one out of 10. It's an epidemic. I know COVID, COVID is the epidemic, but there are two epidemics in life at the moment, in my opinion. One is the epidemic of sexual assault and the other is the epidemic of the enabler. And they tie in together. Um, you know, if not for, frankly, if not for the first book on the Holocaust, I never would have heard any about any of this stuff. Wouldn't really paid attention. I would have heard about it. Wouldn't grabbed me in any way. Um, but here I am at the age of 64, you know, like the Beatles song. Um, and for me, this is the, the single most important modest contribution I can make is to at least push the conversation forward. He or she who agrees, agrees. He or she who disagrees, disagrees. But it's a conversation we need to have because it really is for me, frankly, and with this I finish, it defines what society is. Is society going to be an enabler? Or is society going to do something and go kick some serious ass? It's, it's stark. It's black and white. There's no gray here. There ain't no gray here. With the exception of the, the question about the, about the whistleblower, which is an important point. But there's no, there's no gray here. From the perspective of the person who's being abused, they're being abused. And they want help. And we're not giving it to them. Wait, we have one more question. Dick, did you, sir, did you have your hand up? Dick. I, yeah, you talked about society, and that brought to me the fact that I heard this morning that in the uh, congressional hearings that are going on now. Oh, about, with Simone Biles in the FBI. Yeah, and uh, the fact that the, uh, the question of whether the FBI took the right measures when they were told about it, or whether they just let it go. So that's another step up that you really haven't mentioned, and that's the uh, law enforcement above the level of the yes. so uh, do you want the polite uh, version or uh, you want the polite version or you want the impolite version which one do you want i'm sorry say that again you were talking you want a polite version or an impolite version give me your version the fbi totally fucked this thing up every which way there are no there's no words and i certainly hope that the 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 fbi uh, well, the agent in charge in, in indianapolis and others pay a significant price they totally, totally dismissed Rachel Den Hollander and, and Dancher. Um, there are various stories out there that he was hoping for a job with, with USA Gymnastics as a security chief. Um, in the same way that I interviewed a woman, call her whatever you want to call her. She's raped. And she, she, she heard me speak, so she calls me. And here's what she tells me. The rape was awful. But what really pissed her off is the cops lost the rape kit. And she's like, and so she she knows the rapist, but she can't prove because uh, 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 she's like screaming at me that the rape kid was lost. The FBI and and the, it, you you, I, you said to me I could say however I want to say it to you. So there you have it. Absolutely, I, it's outrageous. And I mean, then Hollander came to them, and she went to the Indy Star. I mean, thank God for the Indy Star, you know, opening and blowing this thing up. Fabulously, no words. Um, you know, I'll finish with this not happy note. There's nothing happy in my talk. Stu mentioned that I am the chair of the University of Utah's Independent Review Committee, which was established last year in the aftermath of, a, of the murder of a student here on campus. Those of you who are not aware of the story, her name is Lauren Mikulski. Lauren was murdered by an off-campus, on-off, on-off boyfriend, but he, he murdered her on campus. Her murder, which happened in a parking lot not far from here, not far from my office, was 1,000%, 10,000% preventable if the cops who knew would have acted. And that's why, you know, her parents uh, sued the university. They settled. People have lost their jobs which is a good thing, um, utterly preventable. I mean, I, you know, I communicate with the parents, with the mom particularly, there are no words, their child was murdered. 
um, and it was utterly preventable. Goes right to your point. They, she was dismissed. She was this super attractive woman, and I hate to introduce race into this. The boyfriend was black, which was also played a role in this whole how it was addressed, the race issue. Horrible. You can read about it. There, there are a million articles about her online. Nora Mikulski. Stu, with that, I got to go teach. Okay. Anyone, any last minute questions, guys? Okay. Amos, thank you very, very much for a really insightful talk. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm going to put my email in the chat. If anybody, um, has follow up questions. Um, da, 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 da. Feel free to email me um, anytime. Great. Thank you again very much. Go Thank you guys. Go teach. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Thank bye. Bye bye. Joe, back to you, Joe. Thank you. Uh, that was a great. Uh, presentation, I think very, very eye-opening. Uh, thank you for introducing Amos to us, too. And, uh, okay. Uh, oh, One question. You. Stu, how did you find Amos? He actually gave this talk at the uh, JCC about eight, nine months ago, which I, which I attended. My wife and I attended, and I thought it was something that would really be uh, of interest to you guys. That's why I I hooked up with him. Oh, he was great. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'll give everybody a second to go into the chat if, and uh, take down Amos's uh,